Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I want to quickly thank uh, Ali Fahad and the fantastic people at Bak Launch. It's not just one person, it's a whole community um, that's really helping to bring to fore the opportunities uh, that are available in Pakistan and around Pakistan, uh, not necessarily related to tech, but where technology has a vital role to play. Uh, few topics are as important in that, in that space as uh, public health. And uh, aside from me, Bak Launch has put together a fantastic panel. So I just get to sort of sit and ask uh, a few questions. Um, and so I'll be your moderator and host uh, over the next hour or so. And we're really privileged to have uh, Dr. Ifat from Sayyid Ghani and uh, Dr. Ali Chaudhary. I, because Ali and I have been working together um, in so many different uh, contexts, I often forget which of the introductions is the most appropriate, but he's the founder and CEO of uh, Noor Health, um, which is a network of uh, primary and secondary care facilities. Uh, Dr. Ifa Zafaraga is the co-founder and COO for Sayyid Kahani. Uh, this is a uh, essentially an initiative that leverages the access that technology affords uh, to patients and doctors. Uh, both are writing their own, I think, inspirational stories of solving problems in an environment where people like me um, have made a lifetime's work out of talking about the problems. So it's great to be with two uh, professionals, I think public policy professionals, certainly healthcare professionals, but most of all problem solvers and, and I think uh, pioneers. Uh, hopefully most of the folks on this call are in fact pioneers and that's why they're associated with Bak Launch or drawn to what it's doing. So without further ado, um, in terms of the structure for today's conversation, I want to spend a little bit of time, uh, Doc Saab, uh, well, Dr. Sahiba and Dr. Saab, uh, both uh, maybe talking a little bit about the state of health in Pakistan, not health care, but the state of health generally. What is the health challenge in Pakistan? I spent a little bit of time then talking about the health care part of it, the health services universe in Pakistan and how it works. Um, then talk a little bit about the importance of universal coverage I think anytime we do one of these conversations, it's really an opportunity for us to advocate and promote uh, a way of thinking about something. And I think universal health care and especially all the advances in this country uh, since 2014, when Khyber Pakhtunkhwa piloted and then launched and then the federal government adopted it. And then of course it took a new uh, life um, after uh, 2018 with the Sehat Sahulat expansion uh, and it becoming not just a really, I think a bit of a juggernaut in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, but beyond. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about universal coverage and its importance in a country like Pakistan. And then finally, maybe the the, the part of the conversation that's that's most relevant or hopefully most interesting, um, which is the future of uh, of this topic of public health and healthcare services and the intersection of, of that future with uh, technology and the opportunities that tech affords uh, to the people of Pakistan, to sick people, to healthcare professionals, to money people, to investors. Um, and to the country at large. Uh, so maybe Dr. Ifat, we start with you and you know, talk to us a little bit about the kind of the universe of healthcare problems or, or health problems in Pakistan. Off the top of my mind, and again, this is Cliff Notes really from, from Ali Chaudhary. So correct my understanding of what he's tried to teach me over the years about this. Uh, principally, there is a lifestyle and, and public health challenge that isn't about the really scary diseases. It's about the way that people live their lives and the quantum of healthcare costs that those lifestyles uh, then put on the Pakistan economy uh, writ large as a macro, but also on families and individuals uh, in their micro uh, context. Uh, is, is it just diabetes and, and, and heart and tuberculosis? Or are there other really concerning aspects of uh, health problems in Pakistan that, that we should know about? Dr. Ifa. First of all, thank you so much have... to the Launch uh, Network, to Ali, as well as to you for creating this amazing initiative and for talking about 
uh, topics such as public health, which are really important. I think when we talk about public health, I was just going through you know, some numbers and WHO puts Pakistan at 154th number out of the total number of countries, which is somewhere 192 or 194. So you can really imagine you know, the severity of the healthcare gaps that Pakistan has. And you're very right, healthcare gaps, ki jab hum baat karte hai, it's not just limited to diabetes or cardiovascular, although those are also bigger problems. For the longest time being a doctor, we always read as students that diabetes is a rich man's disease. But when you look at the stats today, Pakistan is the third biggest country with the most number of diabetes patients, and it is not affected by people's income bracket. But I think other bigger challenges that we have as a country is because we lack access to healthcare facilities, especially 64% of the Pakistani population, which resides in rural or low-income communities, they severely lack access to quality healthcare because of which our maternal mortality ratio is really high. Our infant mortality ratio is very high. Growth stunting in children is really high. And, you know, as a country progresses, one would think that, okay, these numbers might get better. And they were also getting better. But I think when natural catastrophes and pandemics, when the floods hit Pakistan, we are again a decade behind of where we started off. And, you know, if we just quickly talk about floods only, I think it was a time being when, you know, everyone was talking about it till floods were in the news, in the media, people were concerned about it, people were gathering, you know, funds, opportunities, healthcare opportunities, but as the media um, frizzles out, so do the opportunities for those people. And the gaps that we see in that part of the country are really, you know, really, really sad. So we, you will see diseases, which are really treatable diseases, such as malaria. You'll see children dying of disease such as typhoid. You'll see children dying because of diarrhea, just because the people, the families, the parents are not literate enough. They have no access to quality health care. They don't have access to qualified doctors. And unfortunately, quackery is one phenomena which is very common in these places because they, they don't have any other place to go. So I think a big problem that we have in Pakistan is lack of accessibility. We have some diseases which can be treated, which are so much simpler than tuberculosis and diabetes, but because of the lack of access, even those diseases are not treated and people end up suffering, even losing their lives. And, and I think the last thing that I'd like to state here is a large part of our healthcare comes out of people's own pockets. It, it's stated that 70 to 75% of the healthcare in Pakistan comes out of people's own pockets. But whose pockets are we talking about? Are we talking about our pockets? Are we talking about the pockets of people from the peri-urban or rural or remote communities? And their entire family structure entirely changes if one person falls severely ill because they end up selling their livestock, they end up selling their households, they end up really entirely shifting their entire household dynamics. Agar paise jama kiye the, ko ke liye, so those children are never sent to school, unfortunately, just because one person got sick. So I, I think, you know, on a bigger level as well as a smaller level, these are the kind of challenges that we are facing as a nation when it comes to public health. Oh my That's goodness. a fantastic intro, Dr. Ifat. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary, talk a little bit more, maybe expand on some of the stuff that uh, Dr. Saiba just said. But to me, this uh, some of these more foundational problems seem like they might affect the overall picture much more than we might give, give it credit for. So low literacy rates for young mothers uh, resulting in high levels of child diarrhea resulting in infant mortality, uh, low levels of female labor force participation leading to high levels of fertility rates and also high levels of uh, poor performance on maternal and neonatal health. There's a, there's a connectivity between healthcare outcomes at the individual uh, family, community, and, and country level and some of the things that you wouldn't think of first when you think about health. So I think uh, stunting and wasting, Pakistan has 40% stunting, which is a phenomenal sort of, it's a world beating number. It, it's, it's scary actually. Uh, it has uh, illiteracy. Uh, again, 40% of the population is not literate. There, there's a range of these problems that are 
associated problems. How do those problems impinge on or help define the 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 problem universe that healthcare professionals like yourselves are trying to solve in this country? Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, Musharraf, and uh, thank you, Dr. Fritz. Um, you know, elaborating and expanding on what you're saying, look, when you look at the disease or the age spectrum of what we're dealing with, we have one of the highest growth rates of population, two, two and a half, three percent at times we are touching that. So the influx of the problem coming into the system is high to begin with. That leads to early childhood disorders, malnutrition, stunting, you know, fertility issues and all of that. And secondly, then you are left on your own for the next 40, 50 years of your life to not take care of anything because you are socioeconomically the person that's responsible and have a certain social expectations of what you're going to do. So you're paying for everyone's health, but not investing in your own and risking the whole socioeconomic setup because you have elderly. And then when you get into the later half of the life, which, you know, as you look at the paper and when we looked at the average life has increased in Pakistan as well. So it's adding to the whole problem by having the disease burden that's increasing in that age segment and that is burdening the whole micro and the macroeconomics of a country. So when we look at this whole problem, it's a multifaceted, multi-age, multi-sectoral, urban, rural, all different angles that we have to look at. And this is where we see the biggest disconnect is not understanding what the underlying problem is. And we keep focusing on, you know, in a dark room like elephant, there's a tail and there's a leg and there's everything. And we expect some miracles to happen by doing this. And secondly, which worsens the whole issue, and we'll talk more about when we get into healthcare side of it is, and I've alluded that before as well, that you know the biggest fallacy in Pakistan is that we are a publicly financed public healthcare system, and as Dr. Ifrit alluded to that as well. We are a privately delivered, privately financed healthcare system where the incentive does not is not in place for us to take care of all the problems I've just highlighted, early age, middle age, late age, we're not incentivizing that. We're only focusing on acute care because commercially that is closest to what the financial sectors understand as an industry. And that we'll talk more in, you know, has worsened the whole issue by segregating and by combining it at the same time and lumping it with the nearest industry and saying, look, this is what you're going to get. So investments, you know, in the sector, they have lagged way behind any other sector that we have seen in Pakistan, which to me uh, is, is the biggest opportunity as well if you change the lens how you look at it. So it's a, when we look at it, you know, it's a very multi-sectoral, multi-faceted, multi-age, multi-disease problem that you have to understand first before you start putting solutions in place, uh, whether it's, say, it's Olat card, whether it's, you know, early age screening and uh, all the other government programs that run on you know episodic basis, you will never be able to get to the bottom of the solution, which is the key factor to unlock the socioeconomic growth of the country. No country in the world has grown without solving the healthcare paradigm in the country. So we keep talking about all the other things, but we're not understanding the issue that we're alluding to that we need to address uh, at multiple levels. You're on mute, Michelle. Thanks. That's two for two now. Um, uh, I'm going to take advantage of what you just said and, and maybe pick on you a little bit if 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 you will allow me that uh, that that uh, freedom and liberty, um, and maybe ask you to talk a little bit more about the 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 sector part of it. Right? You you alluded to uh, public sector versus private sector. Um, but I want to give that question a little bit of a twist. Uh, you know, I have the privilege of having known you for a while. You helped set up uh, the Saudi Aramco, Johns Hopkins sort of, uh, you know, very large and very successful intervention many years ago that, that now is held up as an example. But maybe a critic, and that's not me, but I'm saying a critic out there might say to you, listen, Chaudhary, you've got the privilege of having worked in a resource-rich environment, right? And so maybe uh, when it comes to a more complex place where there's less resources, maybe we don't have the luxury of trying to understand the big picture all at once and then solving everything in a very Johns Hopkins or Harvard or, or Saudi Aramco way. Maybe 
we just got to fly by the seat of our pants and just do whatever we can when we can. So mm -hmm. what would you say if somebody was to make that critique? And, and if you could frame your answer within the context of public versus private uh, healthcare provision in particular. Yeah, yeah. So look, the first, you know, the uh, notion that everyone says, oh, the resource differences. Look, resource differences between West and Middle East and Pakistan, it's obvious, it's nothing secret about it. But at the same time, if you look at the resource relative to deployment of those resources to solve the healthcare paradigm, even U.S., which is the largest economy in the world, couldn't do it. So it's never only the question of resources that are going to solve the problem. It's the deployment of resources and the incentives and the policy levels that you put in place that are going to solve the problem. So that's one part of resources when you look at it. The second part of it is not under why I'm saying not understanding a problem. And no one is asking to go into the in-depth detail. The things we're talking about is already out there. We just need to put it together and understand, okay, this is what we're trying to address the issue. We're not talking about doing, you know, uh, you learn as you go and you will, uh, at, you know, get more in depth and more thing. But at, even at the macro level, we are still in the framework mindset of infectious disease timeframe that the Pakistan is still, a, you know, a, a frontier economy with infectious disorder, with disorders being predominant, which is not the case. So that's the second piece of it, that information is already available and you have to look at it before you design. The third element of this public versus private, you know, discussion we always had, that public is, you know, altruistic and it is serving the people and it takes care of the deprived of the society and private is all about the profits and they are going to do this thing. But understand that there are ways to address that issue as well, which is comes back to the government designing the policies. And when you look at, for example, the Sehit Sulu uh, program, you know, government was doing all three things at the same time. They became the providers, they became the payers, they became the regulators as well. How can you pay for yourself and regulate, self-regulate yourself and say, look, we are a good system. You cannot do all these things. And that's why the resources become a constraint because you're trying to do, you're paying for the private sector, you're paying the public sector to do something. You're paying for their inefficiencies by giving them the budget. And then you are saying, okay, this is the standard I'm going to check you by, which I myself keep exempt from. How is it going to work? How, how are you going to divide resources to address the problem when you don't have a clear idea of where you're standing yourself? Right? So this is why it's not a question of that it's, an, it's a developed country. And we have seen Far East countries South Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries with similar economies or similar situations that have been able, you may not be able to afford a Mercedes, but you should be able to afford a Suzuki in your environment and offer that to the people. You know, we don't offer Suzuki, we keep striving for a Mercedes and then we end up doing nothing for anyone and we end up in the same problem which keeps getting worse by a disease burden. Uh, let's come back to the Suzuki versus Mercedes and, and also on, on Sayed Saul, but, you know, I might have a different view, but, but, but let's come back to that. Uh, Dr. Ifit, this, um, this universe of, you know, public versus private, I think maybe uh, is clear, but not, not entirely clear. I think in a lot of places in Pakistan, there's a lot of overlap as well. When you started uh, Sayed Kahani, you sort of essentially bridged a gap in the marketplace that maybe hadn't been bridged in that way before. Uh, talk a little bit about that experience and, and to what extent either private or public sector helped or hindered your journey. And one thing that I'd be really keen to learn from you, you already mentioned quackery and I want you to talk a little more about that, but also about legitimate alternative health uh, options. I know that both sare padhe likhe log jo hai wo usko na wo usko mante hain tib ko mante hain na wo homeopathy ko to ab gali humne bana diya hai wo homeopathic analysis bhi hota hai which is like it does no harm and you know if you can't do harm then it's it's not considered valuable um and uh, then there's like other alternative medicine there's ayurvedic there's uh, chinese and you know acupuncture and those sorts of things to what extent are are is that quackery on, in the guise of medicine and to what extent is it potentially helpful and i want to load on one other question because i want you to be able to speak about the spectrum mental health uh, to what extent have you found mental health to be 
an area that you know there's demand for uh, that that you're able to cater to or or not able to cater to, uh, Dr. Ifit. So, so I think you know um, a really exciting and wide question. I think I'll start with um, Sehat Kahani and then you know take it forward. I think I, when we started working, and you know, as a personal opinion, if you would ask me as well, the best way to go about, or one of the best ways to go about solving the public private the healthcare challenges in Pakistan is to create public private partnerships, because they need to go hand in hand. Whether whether it's a, at a tertiary care hospital level, whether it's at a primary healthcare level, or any other um, aspect. I strongly believe in creating strong public-private partnerships. And, and here's why I believe this. So, you know, if you look at stats, the numbers say Pakistan has around 1,200 public tertiary care hospitals. There are around 700 uh, privately held tertiary care hospitals. If you look at primary health care centers, so numbers say somewhere around 5,500 basic healthcare units exist in Pakistan. Now, when I say a basic healthcare unit, a basic healthcare unit was supposed to be a primary healthcare clinic located in a community where any community dweller could just go, get access to a doctor or, or you know, a healthcare practitioner and be treated. And in an ideal scenario, the same hospital or healthcare would then refer them either to a rural healthcare facility or a district healthcare facility, and then if needed to a tertiary care hospital. In actuality, a lot of this is not followed. Unfortunately, we all have seen in our examples that even, for example, someone living in Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, if our child gets sick, we end up taking them, them to one of the best best doctors who may be sitting in the OPD of one of the leading tertiary care hospitals. And that's what happens. A lot of times, the healthcare burden is actually diverted to tertiary care hospitals where they, they, could, they could actually be uh, treated earlier. And vice versa, there are so many patients, for example, from Sin, from Balochistan, from very remote areas, who travel all the way, covering all that distance, coming to Dao or Civil or Jinnah at a time when they're just about to, you know, just pass away. It's just coming to a hospital, passing peacefully, or maybe just going there in order to seek treatments as a hospice. So when we started Sehat Kahani, the vision was that at a primary healthcare level, how can you ensure they are accessing a qualified, certified medical doctor? And that's how we started working, that we would actually empower existing nurses, existing qualified midwives in communities who already were running you know, healthcare units, um, their own individual private clinics, or some were also working in basic healthcare units in remote areas. And that's how we started that if we empower them, if we get them connected to a doctor who's online, they should become the intermediary between a coming person coming to the clinic and showing to an online doctor because for a community dweller, for a woman, for a child, belonging to that community, A, most of the times they don't own a smartphone, they don't have internet, they're not illiterate. Even if they were, um, trusting a doctor who's entirely online would be really challenging versus trusting a nurse or a community midwife who they know from many years, who's already present in their community, who is practicing some bit of medicine. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I just, it just as a point of interest, how many of this network initially was lady health workers within this universe? So uh, the lady health workers or lady health visitors number is quite large. I, if I'm not wrong, it was somewhere more than 50,000 healthcare uh, workers in Pakistan. That was the plan that those visitors would be um, qualified to go door to door to people's households. No, but I'm but asking for you, for Sihat Kahani. Yeah. So, so for us, there are around 59 e-health clinics now. We majorly work with nurses and midwives, qualified midwives, all of them who hold a PNC certificate because that becomes um, kind of a requirement for them to practice. So right now we have 59. So that's how we started the journey from one clinic to second, third. Now we have 59 e-health centers spread all across Pakistan. In all of the provinces, we are even present in difficult communities. In difficult provinces such as Balochistan, we are present in Kashmir. We have recently opened up in the merged districts as well. Uh, through different programs that we have. And it, it's a simple vision. That community woman who was already going to a nurse, who was already paying a fee structure, whether 200, 200, and was just being treated at their level should now be treated by a qualified doctor in that same amount. 
when we talk about quackery, who are these quacks? These quacks can be anyone ranging from maybe a nurse who's also doing OPD, maybe a lady health visitor who essentially her job role allowed by the government entails something entirely different. But because there's no other healthcare person in her community, she might be doing OPD services as well. But there may be people who had nothing to do with medicine, who may have worked, for example, in a tertiary care hospital as a guard, as a dispenser, and they also end up opening up clinics. And because people are not aware, people don't have access to information, or they don't have any other alternative, they end up going to these quacks. If you, are, if you were to ask my opinion, I, I believe, because maybe I'm a doctor as well, I, I would just you know say that for me, a proper doctor, a proper qualified physician is going to be an MBBS doctor. But yes, there are some alternate medicines which may be accepted, for example, homeopathy, uh, some Chinese medicines. But, you know, I think it's really important to know how authentic they are from where they have really been certified. Um, what's their backing? What's the experience? Is there any research on those specific forms of medicine that have proved successful? So I think that becomes really important. When we are recruiting doctors for us at our platform, it becomes really important that they need to have a proper PMDC license. They need to have, be either an MBBS or a BDS um, physician who are practicing medicine. So that's how we work around this entire universe of crackery. One thing that I'd like to note here is when we started going into these communities and we started exploring how we could work in communities, we realized we can't shut down these nurses or these lady health workers or these midwives. That's not, not how this model is going to work, but we can pile, you know, collaborate with them. And that's how with us, it has worked the best way. A midwife can continue doing her family planning. She can continue conducting deliveries. That's her job, that's her role. But the regular OPD or just seeing a doctor and seeing a patient and consulting a patient on her own, which is not allowed by the law of Pakistan, she can just discontinue doing it on her own and do it with the Sehat Kahani online doctor. And that's what really makes it legitimate. Yeah. I, uh, you missed the last question on mental health. What 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 mental. amount of traffic or burden that you're dealing with is, is related to So mental health is I think we lost your internet for a bit. I'm still here. I was just asking about the mental health aspect of uh, of the traffic or burden that that you are dealing with. Yeah. So, so I think um, some something which we started doing in the early years of our journey. We uh, actively started to work with some partners. The very first partner that we had was uh, British Asian Trust, and we have continued to work with them. And we started working with them with the notion to create awareness around mental health in low-income communities. Because at that time, we realized that people like you and me are aware. Our challenges of not seeking a mental health expert are different. There may be some hesitancy. There may be a lot of stigma, a lot of social stigma attached for us. But when you go deep down into a community, they may not be even aware. And that's what we discovered. So we started working with them on creating awareness. Today, out of these 59 clinics, 42 of these clinics have mental health services also available. Can you imagine our weekly traction for mental health is somewhere between 230 to 250 patients in the communities only? That's what we have seen. We have our consumer model as well in the form of a mobile app. And we see substantial traffic there as well for mental well-being. But I think in the urban populations, people are more concerned that if they consult, will their employer get to know? Will someone from their family get to know? Can they be anonymous? So our challenges dealing for the urban population are quite different. While for a community, the first challenge is them really believing that this thing exists. But I think the people are now becoming aware. They are coming forward. Somehow, I believe post-COVID, the stigma for mental health has slightly reduced down. No, that, I think a part of it is, please uh, finish your sentence. No, 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 please go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I think part of it, the, the benefit is that this is a, such a vastly young country, right? Uh, median age is 23. And I think Gen Z is a lot more comfortable with uh, mental health than 
then Gen X, uh, like uh, Dr. Saad, uh, millennials like you and boomers like me. Um, but, uh, you know, there's this whole machismo around kind of not, uh, you know, dealing with mental health in a certain generation. And I think we're seeing that with a way that that's fantastic. Um, a couple of things before I uh, take the conversation back to Dr. Chaudhary. You said 59 uh, sort of e-centers that, that you have now, Alhamdulillah, which is fantastic. Congratulations. This is not a very long journey. Uh, how long ago did you start this journey, uh, Dr. Saiba? So me and Sara, we started Sihar Kahani in early 2017. Um, and we started this. Yeah. Well, well yeah. done. I know that Sara, mashallah, was just, uh, you know, uh, she became a young global leader at the World Economic Forum uh, recently, which which we're all very proud of her, very proud of you. Uh, it's It's a fantastic story. And I think something that people really should pay attention to that in less than six years, these two women have put together, I think, a juggernaut of an organization and a model for us to learn from and and really um, harvest the lessons and experiences that, that Seth Ghani has put together. Doc, I, I don't think your story is any less impressive, but you know, you're older and you're a dude, so you know, you don't get you don't get the same props. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, because you're supposed to be successful, right? You're, you're like, yeah. you know, Harvard and John Hopkins and everything. So, if, and, and HSN, uh, anyway. Um, so, Doc, <laughs> tell us about your project. I mean, you started your journey, mm -hmm. I think, maybe about six or seven years ago as well. And, uh, you know, what was the trigger point for that journey? What is this Noor Health Network? Because a lot of folks that are listening might not know what it is, but but I, I want people mm -hmm. to learn about and also, aapka zor kis taraf hai? Uh, in terms of the kind of the middle, the middle of the of the market, yeah. Dr. Charles. So, uh, yeah, no, thank you. So again, uh, Noor Care is an effort uh, after I'd spent almost two decades outside between the U.S. and uh, Middle East. It, you know, I, either I do something about the problems I've been hearing about or I keep silent and stay where I am and enjoy my life. Um, and that's where I relocated back to Pakistan. The idea started a couple of years ago, and it evolved over time. I, I admit that I had to relearn Pakistan. I didn't come in with the notion that I, because I'm a Pakistani and I did my school in Nister and everything, so I should know everything about it. I relearned everything. I spent a good year and a half just to understand what the problem is. And hence, the, you know, the genesis of the paper we did, the public policy paper we did together on the issues, was to frame the problem and bring it forth. And that's where I looked at. That, you know, and I am a private sector uh, believer. I think private sector does a lot of good, but they don't get the credit. Um, so this is where it all started together, where I saw a lot of focus on tertiary care. And that's where, you know, again, that mismatch between the problem and the solution. So we started with thinking about how can we address the primary and secondary care issue, where you can have both a preventive and curative uh, angle. And also a brick and mortar uh, model where we still thought that we think that and we believe that healthcare has still a lot about touch and feel where people need to walk in, people need to be able to talk. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the connectivity with digital is important factor in that. So this is how we started. And this whole segment, you know, other than the public sector of BHUs and others in, uh, you know, semi-urban or rural areas, uh, people ignore the fact that large cities have some micro communities that are of the same dynamics as the rural area. So it's no, it should not be treated any different just because they're in an urban setting, surrounded by an urban setting, but they have the same problem. So this is where we started building, uh, you know, primary care clinics, uh, secondary care um, hospital, and uh, we have 16 clinics right now. We started practically, we started about um, as of June, will be two years ago. Uh, we have one hospital up and running in, in southern Punjab, and then we are offering home services, post-acute care home services in Lahore, and we are uh, getting to expand it, because I believe that this whole segment remains fragmented. You know, if you want to see a physician, what do you do? You know, the old concept of when we were child, little, and we would just walk into a community physician that knew my father, knew my grandfather, knew all the history. And he was the anchor to tell us, no, you just have a common cold, take care of it and you'll be fine. And you don't need to wait for a specialist ENT to see you and tell you you have a common cold. 
So part of it is was to uh, create that, and this is where we created JP Clinics in partnership with the pharmacy chain, with no commercial uh, relationship between both, other than just the ease of access, that you're going to go to a pharmacy to get medication. Here's, an, you know, to, to the point of quackery, or asking pharmacists for a diagnosis, here's a physician in the pharmacy who's qualified, and you would have seen him in another hospital. So he can provide you with a proper consultation, order any labs that can be done as a, as a home collection while making sure you get the proper prescription and uh, you have an ability to walk in and have a follow-up just by walking in back to the same person and same clinic and say, look, it's been four days. I feel better. I don't feel better. So the notion was that it, the barrier to having you know a certain uh, level of technology and others could be taken away and be able to just walk in and get care the old-fashioned way, but with the proper physician. So that's what we've been focusing on and creating this hub and spoke where we have partnered with tertiary care hospitals and be present in the community. And we have learned a lot because being physically present in the community, you're part of the micro economics and micro environment of, the, of that community. And for example, within Lahore, we have about 11 clinics out of those 16. Each area acts differently from the other one. When we were going in, I thought geriatric patients will come. Our most common is 25 to 45 years of age. The person who's forgotten, who doesn't believe that he needs to see someone, but now when he walks in the pharmacy, he says, okay, I'll see someone and get a proper diagnosis. And we are open later than the regular clinic, so they have the ability to avoid going to an ER and flooding the ER with common problems that could be taken care of. We have seen to the mental health uh, in certain areas of Lahore, younger females coming in with these vague symptoms, which turned out to be that they had you know, mental health and issues, but now the taboo is removed because you're going to a GP in, an, in a regular clinic and you can at least get screened for yeah. something and get pointed in the right direction. So this is what we've been doing, um, coming to two years of age now. And uh, let's see, looking forward to it. So so I, I kind of segued into the, the Sehat uh, uh, sort of Kahani and the uh, Noor Health Network Kahani, uh, Kahani because uh, in a sense, I think for the folks that are listening, it's also important to hear about how when you have an idea and you take the idea from idea to experimentation, to piloting, to execution, to falling down and scraping your knees or your elbows and then getting back up and then, you know, uh, going back into the market and less learning lessons and then coming back and going from one to 59 uh, e-centers or from zero to 16 clinics, uh, including now really almost two uh, major secondary uh, health centers, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think phenomenal and congratulations to both of you and, and thank you because I think telling that story is really essential, I think, to hopefully the kind of second part of this discussion for which we have about 20 minutes and there's a bunch of questions that I wanna get to as well, but I did wanna complete our flow. Um, and you know, we kind of already alluded to this, the importance of um, universal coverage, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, you you took a swipe at uh, Sayat Saulat in KP, which you know I'm not I'm not so excited about, and and I don't want us to start <laughs> prosecuting that that specific yeah. kind of public policy. But for any economy, uh, and I just want a quick answer from both of you: Is there any option other than universal health coverage for a country like Pakistan, where uh, literacy levels are so low? incomes are so low, awareness is so low, uh, how else other than universal health coverage can you actually assure better macroeconomic outcomes and better life outcomes for individuals and, and families? Mm -hmm. Dr. Saiba, why don't you go first? Yeah. And well, if you were to ask me, I think digital health is one of the answers that, and, and yeah. it can re definitely go hand in hand with universal healthcare coverage, because I talked about one aspect of creating e-health clinics, but but another you know major aspect of our work is uh, making people uh, be able to access an online doctor through a mobile app. And while we have a consumer app, but our, but our most winning feature has been a corporate application where people who are getting insurance from some of the leading insurance players in the market can also get unlimited access to general physicians to around 40 plus key specialities to mental well-being as well. And when we talk about Pakistan, around 15 million people 
are associated with different corporate value chains. And usually a family size in Pakistan is somewhere around six, mm -hmm. five to six people. So th this is a good 75 to 90 million market that we can cover. So I believe universal healthcare coverage coupled with some uh, you know, initiatives such as digital health can really uh, solve healthcare challenges and help us move from just curative medicine to preventive medicine also, which I think is really important as you progress further. I suspect on, on this point of preventative, I suspect a lot of people that are in the health space that talk to me really aren't talking to me because I know anything about healthcare, but are talking to me because I supposedly might be able to help with, with the preventative part in terms of building uh, a narrative and, and an environment in which there is a certain kind of awareness and an uptake for this. I mean, I know that's initially how I started talking to Dr. Chaudhary. Dr. Sub, in the, in the interim, since we first started talking, I mean, uh, maybe answer the question that I asked earlier, but also talk a little bit about whether you see any sign that preventative is part of the future of healthcare provision in Pakistan. Because my own, uh, and I, maybe it's just the, the wider political environment, but I'm not feeling particularly optimistic after 25 years of, of pushing optimism. I, I'm kind of, I'm exhausted. Uh, and I just, I just don't see any public discourse engagement with issues of preventative, right? Talking about fertility rates, about, you know, working women, about nutrition for babies and making sure how, you know, children that need ORS can get ORS uh, in a timely fashion. All of those things kind of get weighed under uh, catastrophic emergencies at the micro and at the macro level. So at the micro level, it's people, you know, what if it, uh, Dr. Ifa described earlier, and at the at at the national story level, you have people dying of bad water. You have these AIDS needles epidemics that sort of, I mean, it's really gloomy. Can you do anything to help us not be as gloomy and dark uh, in terms of our prognosis, especially on preventive? Oh. So, you know, uh, the, the point where I draw my, uh, you know, optimism is, uh, and this is, comes back from the fact that when I started to learn about the Pakistan healthcare market, our average life expectancy has increased 10 years over the six, seven decades. How did that happen? Right? And despite all these gloomy situations, it happened. It didn't happen just because natural factors changed. It's because there is an effort going on. People have made an effort to do it. The, the key is never the top-down solution. And that's my basic premise of this conversation is can let the private sector grow. Let them do these things. You don't have to provide everything yourself. You create levers and incentives. You can't provide universal health coverage, fine. But give some concession to the provider to do these things then. They can do it at a much different cost because they're already doing it. Let the entrepreneurs take care of this problem. It's a social entrepreneurship, right? So let them take care of the problem. And when I look at primary care, Nobody, nowhere in the world, primary care is profitable by itself. So the question becomes, how do you invest? That's where we found and we thought, okay, let's combine private, uh, primary and secondary care because then one pays for the other and we are able to show and generate a return that can draw more investments from both social uh, you know, investment sectors and the private investment sector. So we need to stop this you know, macro controlling of everything, let the entrepreneurs enabling environment Give them the incentive if you can't cover the people financially. Give them the incentive, recognize them as a sector that healthcare is a sector by itself. So far, I have never seen, not seen a single policy that categorizes healthcare as a sector that is out in the private and public domain where people can be treated as, as a, and get access to all the tools that every other industry has. So how do we expect different results? So my optimism is drawn from the fact that over 70 years of independence, we are able to push the needle and we can still do more, a lot more because of, you know, the connectivity, the enablement of infrastructure, the communication pathways, all of this is there now. Let people do, because look, there are two examples in front of us, telco sector, and you have seen the information technology through software development growth over the last year. What happened? Nobody enabled it. Kids figured it out on their own and they did it. So let create an enabling environment where people can do these things and this problem can solve itself. We are, we'll be able to move the needle and we can be the role model for the world instead of following them and say, okay, how did you do it? Let's try to copy paste that. That'll never work. 
So I, I think that's really exciting, and and there's things that are derivatives of what you just said, uh, just said that are that are super exciting. For example, you know, I, I had a chance to visit a friend who's who basically was a liver donor to to his mother. Uh, this is about 12, 13 years ago, and we couldn't do that in Pakistan. So he had to go to India, and he did it at one of the Apollo hospitals. Um, India has become a major center for uh, global healthcare tourism, and it's become a major uh, driver of uh, foreign exchange revenue, which seems to be a problem in this country. Pakistan already provides that service because uh, a lot of Afghans and, 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 and others actually do come to Pakistan for the high end and healthcare. Uh, maybe, Dr. Ifit, you start and then uh, Ali, you finish. But uh, do you think that that's too ambitious given that we are not able to do our own people and we have so many problems that this is a ridiculous thing that we think that we think that we think that we can host healthcare tourism here. Or do you think these things can coexist uh, where we can start solving some of the micro uh, preventative and primary healthcare problems? Uh, but we can also at the same time create an ecosystem that will enable um, high-end healthcare tourism. I, I think there is an opportunity to create healthcare tourism. Um, and the reason I say that is um, some of our hospitals, some of the you know key surgeries have been really successful in Pakistan. For example, heart transplant. Uh, recently, there, there was a news about you know some very successful you know. Um, tries that lung transplant, kidney transplant is another thing which has been done successfully and is being do done uh, very successfully in Pakistan. I feel this opens up opportunities for economic growth for the healthcare sector, but you cannot ignore the other part. So it, it cannot be that, okay, healthcare facilities, hospitals, or physicians start to be more inclined towards healthcare tourism because that seems more lucrative in terms of um, the money that it's bringing, it seems more lucrative in terms of the opportunities that it may create. And somehow my video is frozen, but I think people can hear me if they can. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I think uh, given that if healthcare facilities, hospitals can really create a balance and they, they really understand that, you know, what level of, for example, working hours, what level of uh, healthcare professionals, doctors, surgeons, nursing care, they need to shift towards that while also making sure they can maintain. I think it can increase um, the economic challenges that a lot of healthcare facilities are facing. But I think there's a lot more to do in order to be successful in this. In the given situation, a major challenge that we see is brain drain. A lot of our good healthcare professionals, whether it's doctors or nursing care or our tech, they are leaving Pakistan. What opportunities are we building for them to be able to retain them in Pakistan to be able to actually, you know, conduct all of this, whether it's our own healthcare, enhancing our own healthcare facilities, our own healthcare services, or even promoting healthcare tourism. What are we doing to really retain them? And, and, I, and I, you know, a lot of, and I'm sure we all have, you know, physician friends who are not in Pakistan anymore, just because the kind of opportunities, the kind of employment they were getting in Pakistan was not adequate at all. So, so I think while, while there is an opportunity, I think a bigger problem is how we can make sure we are able to retain more and more healthcare professionals in Pakistan. Yeah, especially with all the Aga Khan and We've just lost video for Dr. Ifat, but I'm sure she's going to reconnect. Uh, Dr. Ali Chaudhary, instead of asking you to answer that question again, there's a bunch of really great questions in, that are coming from the group. So I want to run through a couple of them. One that I want to actually uh, link my own question to yeah, apne, like you've said, ki, yeah, you private sector ko support karo, government ko har cheez mein, you know, dominant mat banao. And I mean, at some level, I get it, but I'm also very, very hesitant with this whole way of thinking, right? Because humne private sector ko dekha hai ki wo jitni koi kharaab government hoti hai, utni kharaab private sector hoti hai. Basically, wo manafe aur matlab sud, you know, kamane ke liye jo hai, wo wahan pe hai. They're not really, I mean, there's no incentive to, for them to really per, be particularly
whether uh, the pharma sector, the pharma sector is engaged in any way uh, with the overall curriculum for healthcare, uh, what convergence there is between uh, public health and, and, and healthcare in particular and pharma. And then, you know, this question I have about the, the contamination of uh, the Hippocratic Oath, if you will, by the profit incentive that pharma companies introduce into the picture. Mm -hmm. So I, I quickly, uh, Musharraf, to the three questions uh, that you've asked, and quickly on the health tourism. Health tourism is not just about the high-end ones. We have a big diaspora sitting in GCC that comes back every year. Why can't we talk to their insurance companies and offer their preventive care here and primary care here, and it'll take care of the whole you know, family because they afford to. So the health tourism is our, to our own people as well. Secondly, you know, the notion of private sector being, uh, you know, profit uh, driven and not driven by the social cause. We saw the safe service card, right? We were government, when government was paying for the procedures, people were going everywhere. So the plus side of safe service is that when government put the incentive of payment, every hospital, same private hospitals were offering that services and majority of their revenue shifted to those as well. So it's about levels that you're going to put incentives you're going to put. They are a part of an infrastructure that you have. You, you can deny it or you can accept it, but that is part of the infrastructure. And they're in the same environment as, as everyone else is. Unless you control the incentive mechanisms, you're not going to make, uh, you know, make a difference by just uh, looking at one side of the picture. Third part of pharma companies coming in, look, the literacy or the education of pharma and becoming part of the mainstream is need of the time because the care is very multidisciplinary. A pharmacist is trained to do certain things. Pharma sector is relying on physicians to write more prescriptions and we keep hearing about it. Okay, so how are we going to solve for that? Either we keep them alienated or we bring them as now certain places are trying to bring physicians and nurses together to bridge this divide and give them that social standing so they feel like part of the care management as well. And same for physicians. We as physicians have always been treated as differently and we have not recognized that the amount of knowledge that exists cannot be held only by us. We have to have a multidisciplinary care where pharmacists, a nurse, a technician, a therapist, everyone is part of the care that we're going to deliver. So yes, make them part of the main live with the social status, create multidisciplinary curriculum, which is no, we're not talking about new institutions. It's just about how people are going and which schools they're going to and how they're getting educated. Fantastic. I have a quick question for both of you. It's a great question from Asan Ali. And if I could get very short answers, Dr. Chaudhary, you first and Dr. Ifat um, uh, next. To what extent through your journeys and your entrepreneurial ventures in public health, uh, did you find government to be supportive, generally or specifically, local level, provincial level, federal level? Did you find government to be responsive and supportive to what you were trying to do, Dr. Chaudhary? They're responsive to listen, but not responsive to accept. Okay. So they're they responsive are that you're doing something different. Yeah, they were yeah. interested. They heard us and they accepted in their own one. When, when you officially asked them, they said, look, this is beyond us but we agree what you're doing is adding value to the community. Uh, was it, did they put obstructions uh, and, and make, create difficulties for you or? Make no, nothing more than what I have faced and all other regions that I worked with, no, no difference. Okay, excellent. And uh, in your case, uh, Dr. Ifat, uh, how was, to what extent was government responsive? Uh, were they obstacles? Were they helpers? Were they neutral? I think in our case, they have been good supporters and they have uh, backed our initiatives since the beginning. So, so you know, I'll, I'll talk. To, in fact, you know, if I could just quickly name a few. Um, when the COVID, uh, you know, started, uh, because Sarah was very, uh, you know, close to some people in the federal ministry, they were able to crack a collaboration where um, with the Digital Pakistan Initiative, we were able to give our application for over six months. That not only helped us create a lot of outreach, a lot of traction, a lot of people got to know about our service. So, so they were big advocates for our work then. Uh, 
um, you know, one more initiative that I'd like to talk here is that in Azad Jammu and Kashmir, we have partnered with the Ministry of IT, where um, we have initiated and upgraded 13 basic healthcare centers into a telemedicine center, actually, and the government is paying for it. Similarly, for example, the Sindh government, Punjab government, all the provincial um, ministries, we have been in touch with them. We have done numerous MOUs with them. Yes, I, I think one challenge that we face is a lot of times the faces keep on changing. So you start conversation with one person, but unfortunately, if they leave, then your advocates have moved. So it takes a longer time. They they are reservation and, and you know funding private programs. But I think they are trying to change. You just need to be able to find the right people then. I think in our experience, it has been a positive experience. Very quickly, as we absolutely sort of run up against the timeline, Dr. Ifat, again, coming to you, is there any kind of broad telehealth policy? Do you see kind of an ecosystem level uh, regulatory or policy or legal kind of support uh, from the wider public discourse? What does telehealth look like in the next you know, five years? Yeah, so, so um, you know, I put it in the comments as well. So the federal ministry created a basic um, structure of a digital healthcare policy again during COVID. Um, and we were a part of some of those conversations very actively. So, so that policy came out. Unfortunately, with the government change, all of that process kind of, you know, halted at a point. Um, but I think at an organizational level, we have been very strict in how we are managing our healthcare professionals, the, the platform, the different guidelines that we are for, following. I think the future for telemedicine is really bright because when COVID was about to go and a lot of partners that we were working with felt that as COVID is over, maybe the usage for telemedicine is going to decline. But I think Telemedicine is just not uh, the smartphone usage, as I also you know, talked about earlier. It's about all those community dwellers who did not have access to any qualified doctor, any qualified specialist, any qualified, for example, gynecologist, mental well-being expert. So the future is really bright. We were talking about lady health workers earlier. Um, lady health workers visit people's households. All of them, most of them have a smartphone. If they had a doctor online in their phones when they were going to people's households, it can really you know, change the entire ecosystem. Similarly, I mentioned earlier, we are working with insurance companies. Um, this is just going to grow. It's not going to be one or two or three insurance companies, but as we move forward, they really understand the value that telemedicine is going to bring, not only for the lives of the people, but also in terms of the economic benefits that those organizations are going to have. So I think the future is really bright with AI coming. I think we can really maximize and try to see how from curative to preventative, you know, that journey, you know, evolves over the years. I also think that with telemedicine, as that expands, that opens the door for primary and uh, secondary healthcare facilities of the kind that Dr. Ali Chaudhary is setting up. So there's also kind of this uh, kind of phased stage element of the of the evolution where different parts of the story are going to start to piece themselves together and create a really rich ecosystem uh, as we head to, you know, from a quarter billion Pakistanis to 400 million Pakistanis over the next 25 years. And you guys, as well as everybody that's uh, that's been part of the conversation in terms of listening in and sharing their questions, inshallah, all of you will be uh, problem solvers and service providers and uh, both consumers, but also uh, drivers uh, for this market, uh, for a really healthy and, and prosperous uh, Pakistan in the days and weeks and months and years to come. Uh, on a final note, uh, maybe it's faux optimism, but I think we have to dig deep uh, at times like this. Times are difficult and, and the news is only bad and this coming week, it's going to be worse, but it is a country of a quarter billion people. So no matter what happens, uh, don't give up on the people of this country. Uh, the the people at the top of the country have always failed this country, but the people at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, the people that you know have made uh, Sehat Kahani successful, that are making newer healthcare successful, and whose shoulders people like me stand, uh, those people will still be around no matter what happens in the coming week or the coming months. So stay hopeful, stay engaged, and if you have money, bring it to Pakistan, no matter what the dollar's like. Uh, may Allah put barakah in everybody's dollars and rupees. 
and in the work that uh, uh, Dr. Ifat you do and the work that Dr. Ali Chaudhary you do and of course Ali Fahad and, and everyone else over at uh, Back Launch thank you for all the efforts that you make I'm going to stop talking if anyone wants to jump in from Back Launch then fine otherwise you guys can uh, you guys can end the call this was great guys thank you Ifat thank you Ali really fantastic thank you. thank you so much I think really great conversation mm -hmm. And great to meet you, Dr. Ali. And I think uh, no has so, so amazing work. Would love to be in touch. Uh, I've left my email address in the chat if anyone wants to email. Yeah. Definitely. We will, uh, I'll reach out. You know, thank you very much, both of you. Great conversation. We need more of these to get the, keep the ball rolling. Yeah. So, all right.